Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to the 184th celebration of Asbury United Methodist Church. I am Carol Travis, one of the lay servants here at Asbury, and I also serve as the executive assistant for the African American Methodist Heritage Center, an organization founded in 2001 by Bishop Forrest Stith and other members of Black Methodists for Church Renewal. The mission of our organization is to preserve, protect, and promote the history of African Americans in the Methodist Church. This evening, we will spend time talking about the relationship between Foundry and Asbury. Tomorrow night, we will unveil our first oral history showcase featuring William Bill Johnson, one of the members of Asbury. Saturday morning, we'll have a virtual town hall meeting for all members. At 7 p.m., we'll have a youth talent showcase and then on Sunday, we welcome Bishop Gregory Palmer, who is a resident bishop of the East Ohio West District. More information may be found on our website and in, the, in our bulletin. The story of Asbury starts with the establishment of Foundry Methodist Episcopal Church in 1814, and the earliest records reported 38 members, 18 of whom were black, including both slaves and free men and women. In 1836, when it became clear that blacks were relegated to the balcony, could not hold office, could not take communion with white members, and could not sing in the choir, a group left to form a separate church. We were given the sum of $300 to purchase land to build Asbury Chapel, which preceded our existing edifice. This sum, this sum was repaid in full. Though separate from Foundry, we were still led by white pastors from Foundry until Reverend James Peck was appointed our first black pastor when the Washington Annual Conference formed in 1864. During the years between 1836 and 1889, three more congregations were formed by members of Asbury, John Wesley AME Z, Simpson Hamline Methodist Church, in 1875 and People's Congregational Church in 1889. Throughout our history, Asbury has been known for our social justice witness, for providing educational opportunities, for rendering excellent music as the senior choir was formed in 1836, the very year the church was established. Over the years, we will be home to one of the first credit unions in the city, an on-site daycare center, we established Asbury Dwellings, a senior living facility in the heart of the city, and hosted major civic events, including welcoming persons attending the March on Washington in 1963 and the historic election of Barack Obama as the nation's first black president. During these times, the Asbury and Foundry, con the Asbury and Foundry congregations had little contact because our ministries were largely focused on our individual congregations. In 2000, based on contacts between Asbarians, the late Ruth Giles, Lonnie and Floyd Robinson, Jesse James, and Carlotta Jones, Asbury and Foundry members came together to form a religion and race group to learn and study together. Out of this group and the friendship of Reverend Dr. Of Reverend Dr. Eugene Matthews, senior pastor of Asbury, and Reverend Dr. Philip Wagaman, the senior pastor of Foundry, came a powerful series of services of repentance and reconciliation. On March 24th, the congregation of, from Foundry marched to Asbury to offer a service of repentance. And then on April 7th, a large number of Asburyans marched to Foundry Church to participate in the service of forgiveness and reconciliation. In 2014, Asbury was invited to be a part of the 200 year long celebration of the establishment of Foundry Church. At that time, history had already been made with the appointment of the Reverend Ginger Gaines Sorelli to Foundry and the Reverend Dr. Iantha Mills to Asbury, the first female pastors of both churches. The two pastors agreed to participate in pulpit exchanges at least once a year and to develop closer relationships between our two sibling churches. This relationship continues to this day as the churches meet on a regular basis. In 2016, Ralph Williams of Foundry Church started to connect with friends and congregants at John Wesley AME Church in downtown Washington, our sibling congregation. He approached the core group of members 
from the two churches, and we agreed to add the members of John Wesley to our regular gatherings. These relationships have provided us with fellowship, workshops, and a united front to continue to address the issues that affect our city. I leave you with a quote from the publication, Asbury, Our Legacy, Our Faith, 1836 to 1993. The History of Asbury United Methodist Church, Washington, D.C., Paul L. Sluby, editor. The quote says, we dedicate this book to all the saints of Asbury who served well and have long since departed, for it is upon their shoulders that we stand today. We ask God's grace to continue to enable each of us to pass on the legacy of ministry, mission, and love to generations yet to come. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to show you a video of the service of reconciliation between Asbury and Foundry that was done in 2015. The video is called Race, Reconciliation, and Reconnection, the Foundry Asbury Story. Thank you very much. Boundary United Methodist Church proudly celebrates its 200 years of history in the heart of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. That is two centuries of making disciples of Jesus Christ, of loving God, loving people, and seeking to change the world. But at the dawn of this century, Foundry's members awoke to a long forgotten memory, an unresolved legacy of racism from its early history. They sought to repent for that shameful history, to be reconciled, and to reconnect with Asbury United Methodist, a church born from the exodus of Foundry's earliest black members. Here is that still unfolding story. Foundry Methodist Episcopal Church was built from 1814 to 1815 on land given by businessman and lay preacher Henry Foxall. African Americans, both free and slave, were among the first members. They helped establish Foundry like dozens of other early Methodist congregations. They were drawn to the principle established by John Wesley that Methodist churches, like God's saving grace, were open to all, black and white, free and slave, rich and poor. Blacks comprised nearly half of Foundry's membership, but African Americans here and elsewhere were forced to sit apart in crowded balconies and to pray and to receive communion separately. They were not allowed to serve as clergy, or lay leaders, or ushers, nor sing in the choir, nor serve communion. The problem became as the church moved and grew, particularly towards the south, there was a confusion of what to do with the Negro, as they were called. Uh, this became problematic in many fronts. Pastors who were outstanding preachers were not allowed to be credentialed. That was one of the things that started at Foundry was people wanted not just to be participating, but wanted to have some status themselves, to be on boards and committees and being officers and so forth. This was true throughout the whole denomination, where they were welcome on one hand, but pushed down on the other hand. I shall be free someday. When black members of early biracial Methodist churches in the North had suffered racism, and repression, and rejection long enough, they left to establish their own congregations. These new pioneering black congregations remained affiliated with and initially controlled by their white parent churches, but other black Methodists broke away completely to form or join their own independent African Methodist denominations. At Foundry, black members tolerated second-class treatment for two decades, finding ways to address their spiritual needs. In 1829, John F. Cook and Superintendent Benjamin McCoy established the Asbury Sunday School to offer Christian nurture to their people. In 1833, Eli Nugent became the first of Foundry's black members to earn an exhorter's license and then deacons and elders' orders. Soon, black members began meeting and worshiping in members' homes. By 1834, when there were a very substantial number of African Americans decided that they would really 
need to be independent and separate. And for the next 10 years, uh, the foundry helped them uh, leave and a new ch building was built. They organized the Asbury AIDS Society in January 1836. By October, Foundry's trustees had purchased property on behalf of the black members for $300. About 75 black members erected a frame building there and dedicated it as Asbury Chapel. It was still considered by the conference to be a part of Foundry. And it was served by pastors, associate ministers on the staff of Foundry, who were white, serving as pastors of Asbury. <laughs> By 1856, the Asbury people really wanted to be their own church. <laughs> and so uh, that was done. The history of Asbury Church uh, took off on its own way, as did Foundry. Well, both those churches through the years have prospered. Although still led by white pastors, Asbury did become an independent Methodist Episcopal Church by 1856. But the years before and during the Civil War were tough on many black Americans living in the nation's capital. The growing population of free black residents, along with slave rebellions elsewhere, ignited fears among whites. They enforced repressive laws known as the Black Codes. Meanwhile, abolitionists were gaining ground, which angered supporters of slavery. That anger erupted in a destructive outburst in 1835, known as the Snowstone Riot. A young slave, intoxicated and upset about his bondage, allegedly threatened his white female owner. He was arrested and prosecuted, but angry white mobs unleashed a torrent of vengeance against black city residents. They destroyed black-owned homes, churches, and businesses, including a popular tavern owned and operated by a successful black businessman named Beverly Snow. More rioting by pro-slavery mobs followed in 1848, when a group of slaves tried to escape, they hid on a small vessel named the Pearl, but they were caught and sold. And among them were two mulatto girls who were members of Asbury. We um, were involved with the, with the story about the Pearl, the escape on the Pearl, where 75 blacks tried to escape slavery in, in D.C. And we, um, the father of, um, uh, Paul Edmondson had two girls, two daughters, among the 13 children that they had, um, Mary and Emily, who were convinced by their two brothers to get to go with them, and the parents agreed to let them go on this ship to escape the horrors of slavery. One early night, some good friends, some good Christian folk mm. who yes. believed in freedom. Yes. Yes. Range for a ship called the Pearl to take people away to freedom. And six of my children got on that boat. Yeah. Six of my children went away. God help me. Came to a bad end. They ran into a rainstorm and they had to stop. They couldn't carry on. The citizens who owned some of the slaves, uh, all the slaves really in Washington, um, were furious. And so they. Uh, the next morning, Sunday morning, they, they um, want to know what in the world, where, where's Johnny, where's Mary, where's Emily? They were brought back and, and marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. The two young ladies became a cause because they were going to send them down south to become prostitutes. Sold to a slave trader in Alexandria, Virginia, the two sisters were hired out to work by day and imprisoned at night. Their father, Paul Edmondson, was a free man, but his wife, Amelia, was a slave, which by law made their children slaves, except for those who had bought their own freedom. The family sought help from Asbury and other churches near and far. Abolitionist and pastor Henry Ward Beecher was the brother of famed author Harriet Beecher Stowe. His congregational church in New York raised the needed funds to buy the two sisters freedom Mary and Emily went on to attend schools and joined Beecher in the growing campaign to abolish slavery. Good Christian folk, good Methodist folk, mm -hmm. who believe in the right, yes. who believe that freedom is for all. Yes. Oh yes. They helped me. Oh yes. They helped me to bring my babies home. <laughs> Yeah. 
1844, Southern Methodists split away from the Methodist Episcopal Church because of its official stance against slavery. They formed the Methodist Episcopal Church South, but Foundry chose to remain in the Northern Church. In fact, it supported the American Colonization Society, a popular movement to buy and return slaves to Africa. But by the end of slavery in 1865, many African Americans had found freedom and self-determination right here in America, and so did many of their churches. For 12 long years, black clergy had petitioned the Methodist Church for the right to lead their own congregations and to organize their own annual conferences where they could manage their own affairs with dignity. Finally, in 1864, their petition was approved. Asbury Church received its first black pastor, James Peck, and two all-black annual conferences were organized. The Washington Conference for African American Churches in Washington and parts of Maryland and Virginia, and the Delaware Conference for Black Churches farther north. This gave Asbury the strength to develop and grow because now they could claim they had their own autonomy. And this was, this was duplicated across the whole church. Uh, and so the Foundry and Asbury piece on the one hand was problematic, but the release of that made it possible for the two eventually to have a better working relationship. By then, however, some impatient Asbury members had left the denomination to establish other churches in D.C., including John Wesley African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Methodism in America remained racially divided with three all-black denominations and the all-white Methodist Episcopal Church South. Asbury itself developed quickly, led by a succession of distinguished African-American pastors. Asbury housed some of D.C.'s first schools for black children and adults, and was renowned for having outstanding preaching, music, and Christian education. It also provided civic leadership in lobbying for equal rights for African Americans. Foundry flourished as well, growing in size and mission. It too could boast of renowned preachers, worship revivals, and Sunday schools, as well as prominent members. Leaders of the two churches served the needs of the city's poor by establishing a training school for deaconesses and missionaries, and also Sibley Memorial Hospital, which opened in 1894 and was valued for uniquely serving all races and ethnic groups. Foundry also promoted temperance from alcohol and tobacco, cared for orphans, youth, and the elderly, helped establish American University, and engaged broadly in worldwide missions. Asbury, meanwhile, welcomed to D.C. part of the great migration of African Americans from the South, and it responded to the growing poverty and injustice they faced in their new home. A century after its birth, Asbury was thriving. It numbered over 2,400 members, including prominent black leaders like educator and civil rights advocate Mary McLeod Bethune. I remember Asbury used to be so crowded. It used to be crowded. Easter Sunday, you had to get chairs put all up and down the aisles. Uh, the balcony was packed in, people shoulder to shoulder. Asbury was considered one of the prominent churches in D.C. There's a lot of uh, people you talk to here today or going on, and they used to say that when they left home, the parents or someone say, make sure you go to Asbury. By the 1960s, the Methodist Church was mirroring the nation's long overdue civil rights progress as church agencies and annual conferences finally began to desegregate. The racially separated Baltimore and Washington annual conferences were among the first to merge in 1965. And in 1968, the segregated all-black central jurisdiction was abolished. Although historically related and located just blocks apart, Foundry and Asbury had belonged to two racially separated annual conferences and jurisdictions. They were virtually strangers in the household of God. And now for the first time in a century, they would once again be members of the same annual conference, the same jurisdiction, 
the same church family. Foundry began making its own racial progress primarily in the 1960s with the long-serving Dr. Edward Bauman as lead pastor. The church integrated its child development program, its worship services, ministries, community outreach, and finally, its membership. Norman and Francis Prince joined in 1965 because they loved Foundry's extraordinary music. But welcoming them as the church's first full African-American members was also an answer to Ed Bauman's prayers. Dr. Bauman had a dinner at his house for all of the candidates for membership. And we found out at that time, he said there's going to be some trouble here at Boundary maybe, because we would be the first African Americans accepted to membership during the modern times. And uh, we were completely innocent to this, we were completely shocked. He even mentioned that, uh, that there was a rumor out that the NAACP had, had sent us here to, uh, to uh, integrate Boundary. We were just shocked because we had seen African Americans in the congregation and all. But we found out later that they were associate members, not really bona fide uh, members of the congregation. More African Americans would join Foundry and even become leaders. William Astor Kirk and Vivian Kirk joined in 1981 after a long distinguished history of advocating for racial equality and inclusion in the United Methodist Church. In the 1960s, Kirk led the crafting of a strategic plan to desegregate the denomination. Two decades later, while living in Washington, the Kirks moved their membership from an all-black church to Foundry. For my dad, you know, basically it was, why do you fight uh, either formal or informal um, uh, uh, segregation, and then once it's open, and then you voluntarily <laughs> uh, uh, get, your, get involved in, in, in going to a predominantly African-American church, or if you're white, go a predominantly white church. So to him, I, I think it was part of his stewardship to say, look, I'm not gonna do that. And I think he knew of Foundry. Foundry has a unique history in the United you know, Methodist Church. And so I think he was attracted to come here and they plunged themselves into the life of this church at the time. Ralph Williams became Foundry's first black lay leader in 2001. And the church also welcomed several black clergy to its pastoral staff. Having been part of the leadership of the church though, uh, I know that there's, there's uh, there has been a discussion about, about diversity in the congregation for a long period of time. And uh, there, um, there has been an active attempt to uh, integrate both the choir and the pulpit. Racial reconciliation is hard work, and you've got to go through the work uh, to uh, get to the reconciliation. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, still, we're still doing the work. Yet while numerous racial barriers had fallen, there were still racial bridges to be built, historical divides to be crossed, and long neglected wounds to be healed. The United Methodist General Conference in 2000 provided the impetus for cross-racial bridge building. In a service of repentance, the worldwide legislative body urged the predominantly white churches in the U.S. to reach out to black churches, especially those of the African American Methodist denominations, and seek to heal wounds of historical racism. A study resource was published to help churches examine denominational racism and to seek reconciliation and forgiveness. It was aptly titled Steps Toward Wholeness. Meanwhile, Foundry's Committee on Religion, Race, and Culture had succeeded by 1995 in helping the church to become a reconciling congregation, welcoming lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons in Christian love and discipleship. Now they sought to forge understanding and reconciliation in matters of race. Millie Brobston joined the committee after attending a workshop where she learned about institutional racism, exclusion, and white privilege. I went to the committee meetings and started kind of bringing this up and I remember I had this moment um, where I gave Nancy, Reverend Nancy Webb a ride home because you know she didn't drive and in the car I was saying seems like this committee isn't doing much on race um, and, she, and, I, and I remember we had this you know just kind of a you know kindred spirits moment where she's like yeah you know <laughs> and so we thought well let's do something about that and so we kind of started 
bringing it up in the committee and, and we also started recruiting new people to the committee. And so over time, the, the makeup of the committee changed and the focus of the committee changed. So we began to just get motivated and get, get people excited about that. And one thing we did is we hosted the Africans in America PBS series. Um, so we did a four series of um, showing that video and having a discussion. We did activities with the children in the Sunday school. We did a puppet show. <laughs> we did activities with the, the junior high and senior high. We did a, a class. And then we did an adult forum series. We did a, a book review, kind of um, looking at African-American authors. We also went to visit the Underground Railroad stops in, um, down in Alexandria. We did a joint activity with the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual group to Antietam Battlefield and learned about that history. We also went to Harper's Ferry where John Brown raid um, happened. There was just kind of a whole series of events that were happening that I think we were kind of building the momentum. An Undoing Racism workshop challenged committee members to look deeper. And in their quest to learn more about the sin of racism, they looked within. In examining Foundry's own history, they discovered the racial oppression that led Foundry's early black members to leave and start their own church. They decided to reach out to their estranged daughter church in search of reconciliation and reconnection. Because we were founded out of Foundry, there was a, uh, a group of folks who came over after church, uh, came over for church, and then after church we had a meeting, and they wanted to ask us about, uh, about participating in their anniversary. And the meeting started off horribly, just absolutely horribly, mainly because uh, because the, uh, there was a white assistant pastor at Foundry, and he had a photo of Asbury's original chapel. And other literature. And other well, literature. Yeah. And, and so one of the members of our meeting basically says, well, I hope you got permission to reprint that. And that's how the meeting started. But, but as a result of that, and we can't figure out, but there was a connection between our re religion and race committee and Founders Religion and Race Committee. And, and, and our discussion of those two race and religion committees uh, basically stem from the Foundry's Religion and Race Committee having done a workshop on white privilege. And so we, we had a discussion with them about what came of that. And it was the most enlightening thing for me because I had never heard white people talk about white privilege. The two groups met several times to learn more about their congregations. And that learning led them to organize a workshop based on steps toward wholeness. We had eight sessions over about a two month period. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, it was facilitated by uh, Jim Taylor from, from the General Commission on Religion and Race. Um, and um, it, was, it, was, it was a really good workshop. A lot of raw emotions about race came out, and it was, it was very interesting. We, there were about 15 members from Foundry and about 15 members from Asbury. As we were telling our stories, not only about stories of the two congregations, but telling our, our personal stories about, uh, about race and racism, um, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of sharing, a lot of emotion behind it. And, uh, and I think that everybody came out of that experience uh, understanding each other a lot better. Um, because, the, because the walls were brought down and, the, and, and, and we exposed ourselves to each other. Of course, the Steps Toward Wholeness experience could not end there. The two groups were energized to go further, to turn acknowledgement into action by demonstrating repentance and reconciliation. It was agreed. Foundry would prepare and present an official resolution of repentance to Asbury during a special worship service. And in turn, Asbury would accept the resolution and officially forgive its mother church. It would take about six months to organize. Once our group decided to do it, then we started taking steps immediately. We had to go to the church council to get approval. Um, that was not uh, exactly easy. <laughs> but uh, we made a presentation to the church council telling them what we would like to do. Um, 
we had to get the congregation to buy into it mm -hmm. after that. We had to speak to the congregation, tell them how we felt about race and what it transpired uh, between Asbury and Foundry. We had to meet with the black, uh, believe it or not, parishioners at Foundry to sort of talk with them about what we were doing and why we were doing it. We had to talk to the local jurisdictions, the police. We had to sort of uh, uh, do a major planning project to pull off the, the, the services. An earlier incident had provided some inspiration for this decision. While preaching to Asbury's congregation during a pulpit exchange in 2000, Foundry's pastor, the Reverend Phil Wagaman, actually apologized for Foundry's past racism. Wagaman and Asbury's pastor, the Reverend Eugene Matthews, had been friends since they served on the Conference Board of Ordained Ministry together. Now, as pastors, they were also neighbors. Without thinking anything would evolve out of this, we just decided, why don't we start it? Why don't we have an, an exchange of, of pulpits? And so uh, we did that. I think we had, we had two exchanges, and folk at uh, Asbury were very gratified for the fact that I think for the first time, someone came and it, Phil made an apology. I didn't know what he was going to do. I remarked to the congregation that my first sermon there, that I didn't know whether anybody from, in an official capacity from Foundry had ever, ever apologized for that history, but I do so now. And there was a very warm response from the Asbury congregation. I think that in part led to the later service. As I recall from one of the meetings I attended with both the pastors, they just, suddenly a light went off and they said, let's do it Palm Sunday. Perfect time to do it because of what Palm Sunday represents. Um, and so, and, and also right there in that meeting was decided, we'll walk. Just like Jesus walked into Jerusalem, we will walk from Foundry to Asbury. It was very, very well planned. And by the time it got to church council for approval, there was a groundswell of support to, to go ahead and do it. It was, it was inconceivable why you wouldn't apologize for what you had done. Uh, and I remember it was one guy that said, well, I didn't do it. And I remember saying, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> of course, nobody at Foundry had any part in that old history. And uh, I checked around and I couldn't find anybody in the congregation who had any ancestors who had been at Foundry in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, so so I, I, what I said to one of the, he was a leading member of our church and was African American. And I said, yes, of course, you have nothing to apologize for personally, uh, nor do I personally, but we are a part of this congregation, and we are a part of a congregation with that heritage. And whether we benefited or lost, I would say we lost as a result of that, but we are that church, and we representing that church need for that church, which is our church, to repent. Well, that carried the day. <laughs> that was accepted. Although feelings were mixed, the necessary approvals were granted and plans moved forward on both sides. On Palm Sunday, March 24th, 2002, after morning services, members of Foundry marched over to Asbury to break bread and fellowship and then worship together with song and sermon, liturgy and dance. And then they presented to Asbury their resolution of repentance, a climax to that historic day. I was overwhelmed because I had no idea how many people were from Foundry were coming over. And the place was just packed with folks. I don't think I had any sense of what a response it was going to be from Foundry. And so it was just amazing just having so many people there. That was a powerful, moving experience to have folk to come and the descendants and some who weren't descended, but to have that congregation to come to ask forgiveness of what had taken place many, many years ago. And of course, 
the, the, the scars and whatever uh, were still there. Two weeks later, on the Sunday after Easter, members of Asbury completed the Acts of Reconciliation by marching to Foundry, again for fellowship and worship, and to present their resolution of forgiveness to their mother church. This was something that should have happened in the past, but since it did not happen, let's just put it on the record that our apologies are mm -hmm. there and we accept it. And I think that uh, the unique part is that there have been some exchanges of members of members of Foundry having come here and become members, and we've had one or two Asbury members who have gone to Foundry. I didn't have any bitterness or anything with Foundry uh, because at that time Foundry had started, even before they came down to make the apology, they had started more or less interacting uh, and our minister at that time was interacting with them. The biggest thing I remember about that was the Sunday that we all walked from here up to Foundry and how well received we were when we got up there. A uh, large portion of the church walk, took that walk up there. And so the relationship with Foundry has kind of continued uh, through the periods of time. To want forgiveness means that you are really serious about it. And that if you forgive this and people don't have to force you into it, mm -hmm. then I think they're really sincere and they mean what they say. Mm -hmm. That, well, you forgive us for what, for what we have done Mm -hmm. And I think the people are really serious, so it makes me feel better when I go into that church knowing that the people there are really serious about, about the forgiveness. We consider this day and time of great importance in the life of our two congregations as we continue on our journey toward healing of the sins of racism that has plagued us for centuries. And on March the 24th, 2002, Foundry Church came to Asbury Church to offer repentance. To follow in the steps of the God who forgives all, you are forgiven. I think it's a terribly sad history. I think the good thing about it, in a way, as history has developed, is both these churches have gone on to be a very significant part of the life of the nation's capital. Both have done uh, very good things both serving their own congregations and serving the causes of social justice and in both cases serving the uh, cause of inclusiveness. Beyond race and reconciliation, both congregations today are reconnecting in dialogue and fellowship, in ministry and worship. Together they are exploring their histories and expressing their hopes while finding common ground and in the unifying spirit of Christ, building the beloved community. And maybe you have or haven't experienced much in the way of racism in your life. What's the role of the church? And I think that the value of the church is that the strong sense of community that a church brings makes it easier to take responsibility for the past, to feel like part of a collective body that has done this in the past and that is moving towards the future. So we, the Asbury family, join you, Foundry family, in giving thanks to God for 200 years of ministry. This really is a family reunion. <laughs> we journey together. We journeyed apart. We came back together 13 years ago, and now here we are today. And so my hope going forward is that we cousins <laughs> would go forward as a healthy family. And a healthy family has a reunion, usually annually. Let's not wait another 13 years or And so as one family, united in Christ, cousins, brothers, sisters, all, let's continue to walk together. 
to walk into that day that God knows is prepared for us, which is a day in which reconciliation will be not just a dream, but a reality, in which we will be truly freed from those things that plague and haunt us, that break our hearts, that break relationship, that break lives, and live into the community that is our inheritance in Jesus Christ. It is a unity, it is a oneness, it is a family that we share. Let's walk together through all the days and years to come. Shall we? Yes.